sequential development. I'm a music psychologist. My, I do music learning theory. And I, I try to explain the importance of sequential learning. The listening program uh, vocabulary has to come first. If it doesn't, and I don't ask you to use yourself as an example, you may if you want to, but think about it as you know, if there's not a rich vocabulary, it's very difficult to learn how to audiate at a later age. By the way, the older you get, the more difficult it is to develop the listening vocabulary. You learn as you get older more slowly. Very young children learn rapidly. So the best time to do this is as quickly as you can. Preschool, early childhood, kindergarten. And you're not too old to start. One of the best ways to develop it yourself is start teaching young children this way. So this now is the listening vocabulary, and what I'm doing is establishing for children, for you, for anybody, is a vocabulary of context. Remember, when children listen to words, they're not concentrating on the individual words as much as they are the context, the syntax, of what of the meaning of what the words mean. So literally, what I'm doing is trying to develop a syntax for them. I'm not really interested in single pitches. I'm interested in letting them hear context between my tonality and a meter. Questions at all so far about the first vocabulary there? Yes. When you were doing the free flowing movement and mentioned Laban, there's not that's not the only kind of movement that, that he described. I mean there was the punches and slashes. Why this if the music is more slashy, okay. why not slash with your movements? Okay, let's talk a bit about this. There's a difference between time and space. The slashes and the movement have to do with time. Mm -hmm. Time, musical time, is a very difficult thing to learn without first experiencing space. For example, if I say to you, ba, 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 and I have a very slow tempo. Counting isn't going to help me maintain that tempo. What's going to help me maintain it is that audiation or a feeling of space. So you know when the next beat comes because you can imagine how long it takes you to get to that beat in space. So in our research, we find if we start with time and not space, time begins to rush and slow. Students come in early and late after rests. Uh, meter suffers. But if we take the time to develop space and then say, ah, 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 and superimpose time on space, they're going to learn time much better. And that's why I wouldn't start with the slashes right away. It's the movement, the flow, free-flowing movement. See, I think persons like Elvis Presley, so many adults get upset and say, well, there's so, many, so much sexual motivation. I don't really think that was the case at all. I think he was just rediscovering his childhood. I think uh, he was trying to find a childhood that was stolen from him. Because most of us have our childhood stolen from us. I think Elvis Presley had enough in intuition to know he had to recapture it or to learn it. And that's what most of his flow is. Great musicians flow. I'm a bass player and I flow with my bow. <coughs> play this. It's, it's flowing. So that's about the best explanation I can give you. Thank you for the question. Okay, so that's the listening vocabulary. Or anything before I go on with listening. Okay, then we go to speaking. What is the speaking vocabulary of music? It's singing and chanting. After students, babies, whatever they are, have learned to listen well. They've heard a lot of major. So you're just reminding what major sounds like. 
Speaking vocabulary, we get children to imitate very quickly in the same way as a mother, a father, a peer says a word for a child and helps the child learn how to pronounce it. Yum ba di a bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum bum. So the speaking vocabulary then is starting to sing tonal patterns. I hope I'm making my point here without beating a dead horse, but this idea of teaching individual pitches is pretty passe. And we find that we don't learn very much from it. E, G, B, or pitch matching. It's the relationship of one pitch to another that really grasps the listening vocabulary and broadens. So the speaking vocabulary then becomes tonal patterns. It also becomes rhythm patterns. Ba 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 And what you're hoping is that you can get children to learn to imitate these patterns the same way they learn to form words. And they develop a speaking vocabulary. Crossing over this very quickly tomorrow, I'll go into much more detail. If you have questions, I won't keep asking you for questions. If you ask, have them. Yes, sir. Just speak loudly. How do you, um, is there a method for the Can't hear you. Is, how do you know when to introduce or when to? How do I know what? How do you know when to go into the speaking aspect? Uh, you just take a chance and you work. There's no definite way of knowing. When you think you've done a lot of developing a listening vocabulary or various uh, tonalities and meters, you try the speaking vocabulary. If it doesn't work, that means I need more listening. So I just keep going back and forth. I know if the speaking vocabulary doesn't work, I move right back to listening. 